and we have the uh, back barrier environment, which typically comprises a uh, Mars and a lagoon. Um, uh, so barriers are able to keep pace with sea level uh, via, uh, primarily via storm or wash, um, which is the extraction of sediments from the front of the, of the barrier and is the position on the top and in the back. Um, <clears throat> and in this way, basically, barriers are moving in a conveyor belt fashion uh, towards land. Um, and despite um, we have been, um, I guess that um, air scientists have been studying barrier islands for um, many decades now, but there are still actually very fundamental questions that um, we don't fully understand yet, such as is there a threshold sea level rise rate beyond which barrier islands cannot keep up with the sea level? Or um, what is the role of uh, back barrier uh, ecosystems, back barrier environment on the barrier response? Or what is the effect of um, uh, human activities on body response in the long term? So <clears throat> one way that you can answer those questions is, again, uh, with numerical modeling. Um, and because there are a wide range of time scales involved in the evolution of these systems, we can go from um, geometric models, uh, such as GeoMBEST, to um, uh, three-dimensional, uh, uh, much more complex models that couple hydrodynamics and sediment transport, such as x -Beach. The way that you choose the model is based on the question that you are trying to address. Again, if you are interested in the response of barriers to a single storm event, you probably want to use uh, x -Beach, which um, has been already validated um, here in the East Coast and in the um, in actually many times already. Um, um, but if you are interested in the long-term response of barriers, then um, you might be want, you might want to use a geometric approach such as uh, GeoMBEST. So the um, reasons that we had for building our model were uh, very clear. One, um, we wanted to um, have a model that is uh, was able to run fast, uh, so we can explore a wide range of parameter values, and the reason being that. Um, parameters uh, in natural systems are typically poorly constrained. So it's good to have a model that allows that. Um, and then we also wanted to look at the feedbacks between uh, overwash fluxes and, um, and the so on surface dynamics. So the first step, like before, is to idealize the geometry. So we are going to uh, collapse the surface into a linear unit, which is going to be uh, changing over time, depending on the uh, forcing. The superior portion of the barrier um, is characterized uh, for now with uh, just two parameters, the average elevation above sea level and the width. And then we have um, also um, to start um, a linear back barrier lagoon slope. What are the advantages of this? We can characterize the evolution with uh, three variables, the location of the surface toe, the location of the shoreline, the location of the back barrier, and the elevation above sea level. So if we are able to write the rate of change <coughs> of these uh, variables in terms of the leading processes, um, which in this case, in this cross source setting, are sea level rise rate, z dot, um, sediment transport at the surface, which can, go, which can be directed either offshore or onshore, and overwash fluxes, then um, we already have defined, how this, we can already describe how the barrier is going to respond. So here we have four variables, four equations, in this case a uh, set of ordinary differential equations that we can solve uh, over time. Let me <coughs> actually say a little bit more about um, the uh, overwash and, and um, sediment transport the surface. So overwash is modeled very simply. Um, we compute overwash, uh, we rely on the critical width concept, and this means that uh, we assume that there is a critical barrier width beyond which um, overwash will never make it to the back barrier. The barrier is just too wide. If the width of the barrier um, is below this, this critical uh, value, then we will start having overwash fluxes that increase um, proportional to the difference between the critical width and the, and the actual barrier width. Or in other words, proportional to what we call the deficit volume here, um, shadowed in dark gray. 
we extend this definition for the elevation above sea level. So we define a critical elevation above sea level above which the overwash uh, will never make it to the top. And below that uh, value, um, the overwash will increase proportionally to this deficit volume highlighted here. So <clears throat> and this can be improved ma in many ways, but uh, I think that is a very good uh, starting point, in my opinion. So now, what about um, sediment transport at the surface? <coughs> so sediment transport at the surface can be directed onshore or offshore and aims at restoring an equilibrium geometry or uh, equilibrium surface slope in this case, the, given the idealized geometry. So the equilibrium slope is alpha e. If the, if the um, surface slope alpha is uh, milder than the equilibrium slope, then we are going to have onshore directed sediment transport. If we have a um, uh, surface slope that is um, steeper than the equilibrium um, surface slope, we'll have uh, offshore uh, or sediment being transported from the upper surface to the lower surface. Um, now, <clears throat> how fast do we go back to the equilibrium is characterized by the surface response rate, uh, K. And um, uh, Alejand Alejandro Artiz is actually doing some work um, using some um, same transport formulations on the, on the surface uh, from Bowen in the 80s. And <coughs> um, we came up with this um, expressions using this same transport formulation for the surface response rate as a function of the significant wave height um, and, and the settling velocity, among other factors, so basically wave climate. So the surface response rate, and this is the point I want to make, is going to be strongly dependent on the wave climate, on the significant wave height uh, during fair weather, right? And this is what is going to determine how fast we go back to equilibrium. And now, <clears throat> this is a simple model again that can uh, produce four different uh, responses. Um, we can have dynamic equilibrium, or what we call in the, what in the literature is commonly um, defined as a rollover state, with drowning, um, discontinuous retreat, and high drowning. I'm going to go one by one now, actually. So let me start with uh, dynamic equilibrium. During dynamic equilibrium, so we first start, uh, start with the uh, critical, uh, geom the, the equilibrium geometry. And then once we start the sea level rise, the equilibrium geometry is going to adjust to uh, the rollover geometry or dynamic equilibrium geometry, which is different from the equilibrium geometry. And after that point, the, the geometry is maintained. So we have enough overwash fluxes um, and, and the surface response rate is fast enough to maintain the geometry of the barrier as it migrates landwards. But this is not the only way that a barrier can migrate uh, landwards under a constant sea level rise. Uh, we find also that uh, time lags in the surface response can result in uh, abrupt, uh, in abrupt uh, changes in the landward migration rate. And this is going to result in uh, periodic oscillations of uh, uh, many different variables uh, of the model, uh, such as the width, for example. Uh, we can have oscillations. I mean, this is just one run, but we can have very um, large oscillations of the width uh, despite the constant uh, sea level rise. And we also can have um, drowning of barriers. We can have <coughs> with, uh, high drowning, which happens when um, the overwash fluxes are insufficient to maintain the superior portion of the barrier. And um, so barriers are going to, in this scenario, are going to migrate landwards uh, just a little bit and then are going to remain there as, a, as an offshore body. During width drowning, we increase the overwash fluxes. We, um, the barrier tr migrates landwards trying to keep pace with the sea level, but the surface doesn't respond fast enough to maintain the geometry. And <coughs> so basically doesn't send sediment onshore fast enough to, to maintain the barrier geometry. So uh, we also end up with barrier drowning. This is just a plot of uh, drowning times as a function of uh, overwash fluxes, which uh, seems to be uh, critical control on, on these um, uh, different modes of, of barrier drowning. And <coughs> during high drowning, uh, overwash is the limiting factor. So as you increase overwash fluxes, you are going to 
increase the time that it takes for the barrier to drown. But then, during with drowning, we can actually see much more interesting uh, responses. These ones, for example, as it happens, we have a combination of surface response rate and overall wash fluxes that allows the barrier to almost get to the zero barrier width, but then restore back uh, um, just before it drowns. Um, okay, so as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the advantages of this model is that we can explore a wide range of uh, parameter values. Um, and um, so here in this case, we are running the model, I think it's like uh, 10,000 times, and it doesn't take uh, long. So that's clearly an advantage. In the horizontal axis, we have the maximum overwash flux. In the vertical axis, with the surface, we have the surface response rate. As we were discussing before, low overwash fluxes are going to um, result typically on high drowning here in dark, in black. If we have uh, low surface response rates, we are going to typically have with drowning. And um, something I want to actually point out from this region diagram is how small is the region in which dynamic equilibrium uh, occurs, um, which basically suggests that um, barrier response is actually more uh, complex than just rollover. Um, so what happens if we increase the sea level rise rate <coughs> the regime diagram that we were, looking at, uh, we were looking at in the previous slide is this one for 2 millimeters per year. If we increase the sea level rise rate, we see that we have an expansion of the dark uh, colors, which correspond to high drowning and with uh, drowning, uh, which is, interest which is um, intuitive. And it's uh, interesting that it happens in a nonlinear fashion. It seems like there is a threshold somewhere between 4 and 5 millimeters per year in which we start to see uh, more and more drowning. Um, and we can do the, the same <coughs> with the back barrier lagoon slope. Um, and we are changing the back barrier lagoon slope between 10 to minus 3 around and, and 10 to minus 5. And we, despite this, I mean, the, the slopes are very mild, right? But these subtle changes can, um, can actually result in, in very uh, drastic changes on the barrier response which uh, suggests that whatever is going on in the back barrier environment can actually um, affect the response of the barrier quite significantly. And this is what motivated um, us to start looking at a, a better description of the back barrier environment instead of just having uh, a lagoon, right? So uh, now <coughs> we, um, uh, Giulio Mariotti, now at Louisiana State University, has this model for uh, a Mars lagoon ecosystem uh, that incorporates the accumulation of organic matter in the marshes, the exchange of sediments between the Mars and the lagoon, the potential to erode the Mars due to uh, wind-driven waves, uh, wind waves uh, generated in the lagoon, uh, sediment export from the lagoon to, to the open sea. And this is captured by a set of three ordinary differential equations um, uh, which is going to be actually a very good match to the <coughs> barrier model. Um, we have four ordinary differential equations, another set of ordinary differential equations. We can combine them to, uh, and with an idealized geometry like the one that uh, you can see here in the, at the bottom. So now, instead of just having the shoreline and the surface toe and the back barrier face, we are going to include boundaries such as the um, Mars Lagoon, uh, Back Barrier Mars uh, Lagoon, and the Lagoon uh, and Inland Mars boundaries. <coughs> so the first thing that we did is actually to start um, uh, trying to recover some of the results from uh, Laura Moore and uh, David Walters, who actually started working on, on this uh, before we, we did. Um, and some of their results suggest that Mars says, are basically filling some space in the back part environment and are actually slowing down the, the landward migration uh, of, of barriers. Uh, and this, that's something that is captured by the model. We wanted to explore a little bit more. <coughs> and here in this round, what I'm showing is what is the role of the length of the lagoon in the back. So if uh, we change, we have everything else the same, but we only change 
how long the lagoon is, how is that going to affect how the body responds. So the initial condition is uh, here in is the thin line, which is the same for these three runs, right? The thicker line is the um, last stage for the, for the run. Um, if we have a lagoon of uh, only two kilometers, we are going to have <coughs> um, some landward migration of the barrier. Uh, and, um, but as we increase this uh, length of the lagoon, we are actually going to increase the um, landward migration of the barrier significantly up to a point in which we actually can drive even uh, with drowning. Um, and the reason why this happens is a combination of two uh, processes. One is that we have a larger lagoon is going to allow for uh, larger waves that are going to erode uh, the Mars uh, systems um, more efficiently and also larger waves are going to deepen the lagoon, are going to resuspend sediments from the bottom and create more accom accommodation in the back. <coughs> so this is one example that shows the uh, importance of potential importance of back barrier uh, on barrier response. Here we are looking at the exchange of sediments from the lagoon to the open ocean. If we have um, very uh, small uh, exchange, so mo almost all the fine sediments remain in the lagoon, then um, we are going to enhance, uh, we are going to have uh, Mars expansion and uh, eventually the Marses are going to fill the back barrier environment and we are going to have a barrier that is going to uh, migrate very very little towards the land. If um, we <coughs> increase this export to uh, the open ocean, we um, are going to have larger landward migration uh, uh, rates of the barrier and we can even trigger again uh, barrier drowning just by changing again the exchange of same fines in the back barrier environment, um, which I think that is an interesting result. Um, and okay, so what next? Um, so some of the things that um, we are working on now is to uh, connect um, both the uh, cross-shore and the along-shore components. Uh, as you can see today, I've been only talking about the cross-shore, but there are many processes that happen along-shore that can also uh, be uh, very important. And, <coughs> in, and in fact, we are, uh, started already looking at these feedbacks between the, these two components. And it, happen, it, it seems like uh, these feedbacks can actually result in some interesting dynamics here. In, <coughs> in particular, we are looking at uh, the plant view response uh, of a barrier. The only uh, difference along shore is that in the center, we have a narrower width which is going to result in langwar, uh, faster langwar migration rates. Um, and um, this uh, rapid mi langwar migration rate is not going to propagate along shore until some time later, and it's going to create these undulations that um, we think that um, are due to this coupling. Um, so it's still something that we need to um, study more uh, in more detail, and then we are also looking at how to incorporate human activities into uh, this um, type of models. And we actually started already incorporating beach management practices and try to answer questions such as uh, how, how much and how often do we want to notice and try to provide some scientific uh, insight to, uh, to some of these decisions that I typically decided politically, right? And then, <coughs> And this is something that I actually spent some time talking um, uh, here with uh, people at USGS, how to, um, instead of having an average storm uh, that is driving most of the geomorphic change, how to have different uh, storm uh, events and different uh, frequencies uh, for these storms. And, and I guess that conversations here with uh, um, Joe and, and uh, Nathaniel have been very productive in this regard. So. Um, and I think that that's it.